Hey, what is happening, everybody out there? This is Jake James Lugo, senior editor here at thecoalition.com, and welcome to a brand new episode of TK Spotlight, where I bring on phenomenal individuals from throughout the gaming industry, throughout the many corners of the internet, and just overall cool people in general. So today, I got a cool special guest that I've never really talked to before, and I think it's going to be a fun conversation. I got Ben Kuchera from Polygon. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. How you been overall? I've, I've been feeling pretty good, man. There's a lot of stuff going on. Try, trying to have Game of the Year conversations in 2017 is one of the most joyfully stressful things. Right? Like, seriously, <laughs> like, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Because everybody, I think, like, within, like, after, like, the first or second week of December, everybody goes into Game of the Year mode because that's when they start setting stuff up for after the new year and such. And then what's crazy for us now is that we got PSX this weekend at the time we're recording this. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a ton going on, and there is just so much good stuff in 2017, I think. I think this was a really, really, which is good, because I think we needed a good year in gaming, because in certain other areas, uh, in life in general, I think 2017 was a little rough. So having a great year in gaming was was really helpful. There, that's what my mic got broke up for a second. <laughs> oh no! No, I'm good. I'm gonna keep that in just just for the goof of it. But uh, okay. but uh, yeah, I, I think this year could be there could be a very strong argument that 2017 has been one of the best years ever for games because consistently, like every month, there's been a phenomenal release that's come out for any one of the platforms at this point. Yeah, it's it's amazing. There's there's good stuff everywhere. Um, everybody I've been talking to about like just asking what's what's your personal game of the year and it's like people can make such a great case for so many games and there's no like there's no easy front runner right there's yeah. like there's like I think I don't know five to ten things that have just been absolutely phenomenal it's been great it's been a great year yeah like even looking at the game awards coming up this week again at the time that we're recording this for you guys listening to it later the game awards is like in like about two days like that whole game of the year nomination list is just ridiculous like between persona 5 mario odyssey the legend of zelda breath of the wild horizon zero dawn uh pub g for some people like it's just insane like the level of like you know diversity amongst the different types of games we got offered for this year compared to like other years and stuff but but I want to talk more about you. I want to talk more about your work because you've been in the game as far as writing about games, talking about video games for a very long time. I th- believe I want to say since the early 2000s, if I got my dates right, you started off at Ars Technica, you went to Rock, yep. Paper, Shotgun, and now you're over there hanging out at Polygon. You've been doing a lot of stuff. I mean, has it been surreal like all, throughout all the different years for you? So I, I, got, I got a little correction for you. I went from Ars Technica and then I worked at, at Penny Arcade for two years. Hmm. Okay. And, the, and then I've uh, been at Polygon for, I, I, I want to say January 1st is going to be my fourth year anniversary, which seems Congrats. like a very odd thing to say already. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've, been, I've been doing this for, for a really long time. I feel very lucky to, to, to still be in it. Which is cool. I mean, you've written about plenty of video games. You've done so many reviews. You've talked about uh, game-related topics, especially important game-related topics for, throughout the years on various podcasts, on various videos and editorials and op-eds that you've written all over the place of stuff. I mean, over the years, you know, since when you first started, have you felt like it's gotten a little bit easier for you to write about games or at least, you know, come out with a particular topic that you feel is important to present to everybody about games? You know, I, I think... As especially in this business, and w- whether or not you're in uh, writing or game development or podcasting or video or whatever, I think it moves so quick, and I think it there's such a tendency to chew people up and spit them out and always kind of be churning through talent. I think if it, if it starts to feel easy for you, you're doing something wrong. I think when it starts to feel easy, you're on your way out because that means you're not you're not learning new stuff. And if you're not constantly learning new stuff, you are you are not gonna survive. So uh, I, I see I see it. Fe- if it feels easy to me, I feel like it's a warning sign that I gotta I gotta change something up so that it it, it feels harder. That it feels like I'm trying I'm trying something new. I think after a certain point, once at least a few people know your name. And, you know, you have some, some writing credits under your, under your name or you have a little bit of an audience. I, I, I think it's just important to make sure that it, you just you keep, 
you keep up with what's going on. You keep adapting to the landscape because this is this is a business that moves so quickly. Changes a lot. Yeah, that if you want to have if you want to have a, a career like a long term career versus just a job, you have to be constantly looking around and making sure that you're at least aware of some some of the the changes that are happening. Because like when, when I first started coming up. It's it's funny. I, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna talk about streamers in oh, course, YouTube yeah. here in a little yeah. little bit. <laughs> but it's but it's so funny to me because I've been around long enough that when I was first coming up, it used to be all of the people in in print writing were were looking down on people who wrote online, and the people who wrote online really didn't like people in print writing because they saw because we at the time saw them as being kind of old and out of touch. And so there's a lot of parallels like, there. <laughs> yeah. So so when when sometimes if there's like you know a little bit of a beef between like YouTube and online writers or the quote unquote traditional gaming press, when people ask me how I feel about it, um, sometimes it's like you know yeah sometimes I agree with this person on this thing I agree with that person on that thing but overall it's like. I know where they're both coming from because I feel like I've been through it a little bit already from the other side. And I think if there isn't something new coming along that thinks that what you're doing is old and out of touch, you'll never change, right? Like yeah. you need someone right at your heels keeping you hungry or else you're, nev you're never going to evolve and adapt. Do you feel like when there's a level of challenge, like you said, like there always needs to be some sort of challenge, you know, to constantly produce good, high quality work out there for people. Do you feel like the more higher level of the challenge or the more strenuous the challenge is producing that type of content, the more important whatever it is that you're presenting the audience, like whether it's like a super important topic that people need to be informed about, a discussion that needs to be had about gaming or the industry or any particular one release or something like does does the level of importance kind of relate to the amount of challenge that goes along with it? You know, it's it's a big question, and I don't know as, as I get as I get older and as I've, I've as I've done this um, for a lot of years. It, it's like I, I almost think that even though how the information is presented may change, and like kind of the rules of how you get along in that medium and and the, the ins and outs and doing it and how to do it well change. I think kind of the fundamentals always stay the same and the thing the thing that I worry most about when it comes to people who do video online isn't isn't them as competition because I think in a lot of ways they're creating a new audience versus taking my audience if that makes sense there's no scarcity model like i, I hear that yeah. word thrown around a lot especially within the youtube or the content creation realm because that includes youtube twitch and other different platforms outside of the traditional like writing up an editorial for a website like that scarcity there's always this kind of like feeling of like you know you have to get yours from everybody else because everybody else is going to take yours away from you right like they're like the idea that there's a hundred people consuming this content and if youtube takes 50 of them I lose 50 instead of number one, like people who read about video games are listening to podcasts. They're watching stuff on YouTube. Or vice like versa. They're, they're, yeah. But the other thing is, I think, I think a lot of the video audience is a little bit younger than the people who read about video games, but the people who are growing up reading about video games, they're not stopping reading about video games. That market is still staying. It's just the people who are watching a lot of video, I think tend Based on my experience, I could be completely wrong, Skew may be a little bit younger, and they're going to grow up watching videos about games and watching people, uh, you know, playing Let's Plays or streaming or casting or live esports, and they're going to grow up with that scene, and by the time, you know, they're in their, you know, whatever age I am that's too old... It's there's it's gonna be like they're gonna be complaining about all these new like you know VR gamers or you know holographic gamers who are getting their news in this other way they don't understand. Um, so I, I think it's always gonna be something. I wish when it came to the video realm, I'm less concerned about competition. I wish the people on YouTube had like health insurance, man. Like Everybody I wish they have health insurance. <laughs> yeah. <It's very> simple. <laughs> 
I, I wish I wish they didn't have to feel the need to stream like 12, 12 hours a day every day or lose their audience. Like the demands of that job. It's insane, yeah. I, and you know something? I could kind of relate a little bit with that. Like, I can understand a little bit of it because growing up, at least for me growing up, I grew up within the print generation. I grew up reading magazines, you know, Grain Pro, uh, Nintendo uh, Power, etc. And a lot of that does transfer a little bit over to uh, being able to kind of like, you know, read stuff online, which again, it's kind of like in the same vein. So it's a little yeah. bit different for like, as you said, for the kids growing up now where all they know is video, all they know is YouTube, because that's the hype culture right now. That's the in thing. Yeah. That's the fad. And I think also because of the younger generation, because maybe there, there's a lot more naivety to the world around you and a little bit much more ignorance compared to obviously the older generation that's already engrossed alongside all of this. There tends to be a different mindset and a different process to like interpreting things around you with that. Like I, I I never was down, and I'm curious on your thoughts on this, why there was always an us versus them mentality. Besides the scarcity model, I always felt like, you know, for the longest time, especially over the last few years, there was always this kind of like, you know, in crowd or kind of like, you know, fad amongst people, especially when they want to be, you know, kind of in with everybody else to take a shot at the other side. And I never was never down with that. Like, I've asked a couple people that have come on the show about this stuff, and I've gotten a variety of different answers, but I'm curious on your thoughts about it. Well, and you know, it's... I think it's important to talk about, first off, because um, I, I'm going to give an answer I usually don't like when other people give me this answer about things in video game culture, which is like, oh, that happens everywhere. Because <laughs> because video games, that's our house, right? Yeah, and that's, I don't that's care our what's, field. That's our role. Right. I don't, I, don't, I don't maybe care what's happening in other people's houses. Like, I, th I think it's important to keep my house clean. Exactly. And if video games is, if that's our house... Then I think we should all work together to keep our house clean. So, like, I get why we're talking about this in terms of our house because because it's our house. But ultimately, I think the answer is I just I, I really do think that's human nature. I think when you're talking, you know, if you're talking about um, if you if you're into Nintendo, Microsoft, or Sony, if you're into if you're into certain bands, if you're into certain styles of music, if you're into different anything you will get people who who don't have to just feel like they're right, that they have something that works for them, who have to feel like the thing that the other person likes is wrong. Yeah. So, it, it's and it's like, I, I, I do believe in, in all forms of everything, like, there's some caveats. Like, as long as you're not hurting yourself or other people... Like, you know, let people be into what they're into. And I, I think I think there is I think there is a little bit of that. But when it comes to when it comes to new and upcoming things like like video or when I was younger and it was online writing versus print and whatever is gonna come up next, I I think a healthy amount of us versus them is actually okay. Because again, as long as you're not hurting yourself or others, I think I think a little bit of like rivalry is okay. I think a little bit of like fr even friendly trash talking is friendly okay. Competition, kind of. Yeah, like I, I think I think sharpening I think sharpening your your claws on on the next thing is is kind of a good idea even because even debate yeah, to an extent. Because if you're not if you're not threatened a little bit and i mean that like oh my gosh they're gonna take my job if i'm not careful by what's coming up behind you you aren't you're, you're not gonna get better you have to feel that threat a little bit and if the the people coming up behind you if they don't go we do have to be a little bit better because we're newer and we, we have to fight for an audience and we don't have the built-in advantages that, that some of these older sites or you know older people with with writers do then they don't have as much of a reason to get better and, and to really crank on their skills and, and, and to really put the time into it. So um, I often wish that there could be a little bit more understanding because I think it's a generational thing. I agree. And I think, and I think it's like so many of us who write about video games online kind of went through that, that transition the same way uh, the, the video people did um, or are, are doing right now. And, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit too nasty, and that's always going to happen in all forms of life, but it's, 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 all, it's all part of it. But, but I, do, I absolutely do think there could, uh, there could be a stand to be a little bit of a shift towards 
more understanding and more positivity. And I want to be like absolutely clear saying that that is a lesson I have not always learned in life myself. I'm not try- up. It's okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not trying to to stand on high and say I figured it out. This is how everyone should do it. Like, I've I've gotten involved with like some really ill advised online fights in my time it's over okay what amounts hell's in your day. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> with over stuff that you know amounts to nothing because pride gets involved. And but yeah, like you know you you learn your lesson and you grow up a little bit, but. I, I think the nice thing, if there's if there's any anything nice about going through that part of being younger, is that when I when I see some people take shots at me, it almost makes me a little bit more understanding. I'm like, yeah, they're young. That's what you do. Like you know, like you're, you're trying to find an audience. You 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 you, you want to differentiate yourself, and it, it can be like really tempting you know to something? like. You, you know something, and, and one of the things that I always find uh, weird about this, and I agree with you, it is a generational thing, but also I just think it's 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 exclusively like a, a YouTube slash new media type of thing. And, and it sucks to say that, but you usually see that type of mindset or you see that type of stuff that's always talked about, usually when it's related to that type of stuff. And one of the things I was always confused about, and I, and I say it to not just people that are within the industry that that work for different sites or freelance for different sites, but even people that are trying to build their own YouTube channels and their own audience and stuff in a variety of different places. Why isn't there more collaboration between the two sides? Like I'm always of the mindset is like, why not just like, okay, if you have differences, you have issues or you have differences of stances or perspectives on certain stuff, why not go to the other side? And at least try to work on something to find that mid ground and at least try to find something that the two of you, if you're already dope doing dope stuff on your, each of your respective sides, why not the two come together and make something dope collectively? Because then the only ones that win in the end is the audience. I always feel like why take, why take a shot across the bow like that when you two could both continue the conversation about video games elsewhere? Well, here's, here's the thing. I, I, I think a lot of people are. And, and I, I think the reason we don't talk about it as much is that when that happens, it's almost invisible. Because Kinda, when you have yeah, I agree because with that. when you have so like one of the one of the, the cool types of stories I like to do sometimes, it's it's literally just, just a post where I like put someone else's video at the top of the post and I provide like two hundred words of analysis and I go like this is why I think this is really interesting and this is why I think you should watch it. It's up top, watch it. And that's that's the entire post. Right? I'm just pointing to someone else's video and yeah, saying, right. watch it. This is, and I add a few thoughts of my own that hopefully, you know, I'm able to speak to my audience and my audience gets to look at a video creator and, and see their point of view. And the, the video creator gets the clicks because they're still clicking on the, the YouTube embed and, and, and they're getting, they're getting the, the ad impression and that sort of thing. It's invisible. No one talks about that. Or when you have someone uh, from the video side of things, if they read, like, you know, a, a super good Waypoint or Kotaku story and they do a video about it and they, they put their own spin on it or they talk about their thoughts on it and they offer their analysis and they go, you know, it all started from the story, it's invisible. No one talks about it. Do you think that's because there's some type of animosity that's been lingering around for a while? Because granted, stuff that's happened over the last few years, you know, with different stuff in the news and, and stuff on social media and such do you feel like it's not just the audience but even just the people involved it there's like that that nasty animosity that just won't go away no i think i think it's more that just like it doesn't make news when things work the way they should true so no one no one sits down and discusses on a podcast all the ways that a, a relationship between two art forms is going well because it just it goes well when things blow because when it, but when things blow up or when there's a big fight and when there's a big argument, then it, that turns into discussion because then there are sides. When people are working together, there are no sides, so there almost isn't much of a discussion to be had. You just point to it and go, "Cool." Yeah, there's like drama. There's it's drama. working. <laughs> but but if, if if there if there's an argument and there's sides and everyone feels like they need to pick a side, 
then there's discussion. So, then it's like, so then there's a headline. So let me ask you this, because I think this is also important and related to this. Before we, we switch a little bit of gears, because I, I've asked somebody that also was on, on the show. I've asked two people, correction, uh, that I've had on the show about this before. And it's something that's happened to me as someone that's a newer person, you know, in this field. Uh, I don't consider myself a content creator as much as I do a games journalist, because I, I kind of gravitate more towards traditional writing because I came up and grew up with that type of stuff. But like over the last like few years, I've noticed that the term or just like the title or just the occupation of someone calling themselves a games journalist has become almost like a derogatory thing in the eyes of some people. Now, I'm not saying that because it's a bad thing to do. I mean, you're a games journalist. I'm a games journalist. We can know plenty of other individuals that do phenomenal work within this field that that consider themselves that or some variation of like the title editor, senior editor, etc. But like... I've noticed not just with myself, because I've experienced this on social media, where people will use that to take a cheap shot to say like or to discredit somebody because of a difference in opinion, whether it's because they they feel differently about something that they want to make a YouTube video about and all this other stuff, or they feel like they just didn't like what you have to say about something. And like, they you know, they're all rah rah with it and stuff. But like, what is what is what's your thoughts on something like that? Because I've seen that start to grow like gradually over the last like year or so. Well, what I what I think is funny is that like whenever anyone is taking a shot, they always put it in quotes, right? Yeah, like, games journalist. Exactly. <laughs> like why? Wow. Um, it, but it's it's one of it's 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 one of those names that like outside of people who use it in a derogatory sense, I'm I'm not sure I've often ever heard it outside of that context. Like, I don't know a lot of people who do this professionally who call themselves that. I, I don't think in the industry it's a term that's often used. It's like, and if you look at what I do, you know, there, there'll there be some weeks when I'm writing about movies and TV more than I'm writing about video games. Sure. There, are, there are other entire months where I'm writing just about video games. Like, it, it comes and goes. And, you know, my title at polygon is the the senior editor of the opinion section you yeah, know which is a little more generalized because yeah like, besides different topics but i i even noticed that even for for outlets and different places where people just exclusively write about games or cover games but they're still just called editors like we don't say games journalists like that it's not like in other fields i've noticed where they'll say like entertainment journalists or new uh was it white house press journalists etc sure yeah and, and it's and any anything you do in this space, uh, whether it be um, doing videos, writing, uh, doing podcasts, whatever, it's like it, it's such a, it's it's such an odd combination of skills that you have to be good at that it's hard to give it the name of a job that existed before this existed. Because when you say when you say journalist, that brings to mind this very specific thing that was almost even fictionalized when we consider it to be like the golden age of journalism right like an urban was, legend <laughs> yeah it, it's like this idea that mostly existed in movies of like old white guys in a room drinking whiskey and deciding on headlines we're, we're in fedoras right like i can we're, picture, yeah, I, can picture jason Shire, I can picture jason Shire like that because the, the man's got ninjas somewhere like he gets like, super, <laughs> like crazy. I'm, I'm gonna have him on the show one day i'm gonna be like yo okay so where the ninjas at be like <laughs> like but but i could totally picture that like if, I, if we were gonna look at that term or just that title or that phrase in the more traditional sense he would be someone like that like a patrick klepik would be something like that you know where they go on they do a little bit more investigative stuff as opposed to just reviews etc yeah like if you want to if you if you want to use the 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 often loaded term uh journalist in a positive way i would absolutely apply it to gentlemen like that way more than myself because i am so opinion based and i am so analysis based for for better or worse uh depending on what you think about what i'm saying but like I, i'm not often spending a lot of time out there you know, digging, trying, trying to break the news. I'm usually discussing the news. You don't got ninjas. <laughs> that, I that's the main yeah, my, my ninja team is, is, uh, lower on the ninja scale, I guess. So, and, and there's, and there's so much, you know, I know people who, even the term content creator, I think, I, I know people who think that term is a really crappy term because they're like, it makes it sound like I'm for sale. 
Like I'm, I'm just paid to I've like. I've done that before, and I, and I hate that because that's such like a a random thing that gets thrown out there. Like I did a review one time for IGN on a Naruto game, and immediately the the reason why I got to do that as a freelancer is because I love Naruto so much. But immediately once it went up, the the first thing that people had said, like in the thousands and thousands of comments, was that they thought that I wasn't a true Naruto fan, and I was paid off to give it a bad score. Like I I don't get that. I don't get that logic. And it's so so. It's like I, I don't using these terms. There, there's always a good and bad for for all of them, and it really depends on it depends on how you see it. And there's 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 so many things you have to do to be good at any of them that I don't know that there is a good like single word to describe what the job is. Because ultimately, wherever wherever you are. Wherever you are, if you're on YouTube, if you're on Twitch, if you're making podcasts, if you're writing, if you're even if you're in print, um, I guess I don't know if magazines still exist. I, I, there, I, there are a couple. I, there's a couple. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been in an airport for a while. Um, so, like, the, but the the challenge, what, what the actual job is, is just getting and keeping people's attention. That's all it is. I agree. And how and how you do that. There's, there's 10,000 ways to do that. And if you even look at 10 different people on YouTube, they're doing it in 500 different ways, from video to video. It's like, you know, I, I remember back when PewDiePie was a guy who played horror games and was scared all the time. And that is not who he is today. You know, like, he evolved and he found different ways to keep people's attention. And he's even talked about, he was like, that's just, that was fun for a while, but I had to do something else to to, to branch out and, and try new things. And now, like, I wouldn't even know how to describe what it is he does because he does so many different things in so many different areas. I think in that case, uh, it's more, at least for them, you know, in that video side of things, I think it's more accurate to call them personalities because that's what I feel like, you know, not, not celebrities yeah. like how it, it is in, like, traditional entertainment, like with music, movies, and, like, you know, modeling and all this other stuff. But I still look at them as personalities because you're still looking at the individual. You're still gravitating towards what type of person and what they portray on camera. You know, that personality that's so gravitating gravitating towards you i i think that's a really really good argument and i'm not i'm not sure i've ever thought about it that way and i think you're right because that is at this point what pewdiepie is succeeding on right it's yeah. not a format it's his personality it's getting that personality and that point of view across it's him yeah it's him which is why he can do so many different things and it works because the thing that they all have in common is him it's his face in the video. It's his voice. It's those mannerisms. So, so yeah, I, I, I think being personality based, it's it's also I think super important when when we talk about this as a business or in general terms. It's almost important to leave PewDiePie out of it because he's such an outlier that it's not a good case study. Like, and like how, an exception to the rule, almost? He's an exception to every rule because he is so big and he got there so early and he built his audience so successfully across a relatively long period of time. Like, dude's been doing this for a while. You know who's a good but, way, person to look at in, in that case, looking at it through that lens? Greg Miller. Because Greg Miller yeah. has, has a scope between not only just the seven or eight years he was at IGN where it's that traditional side of things, but also looking at the new media side where he was around during that transition where a lot of places are doing more video content. And now he's full-time video, you know, doing stuff with Patreon and, you know, with the kind of funny brand. The, the way he has navigated his career, just leaving the creative stuff of what he does out, which I think is is awesome. The way he has navigated his career, I find really inspiring, because I I think people who are out who who are who are fans or, or viewers or who just like him as a person or a, a Twitter personality or whatever, if you haven't been in the business. Uh, and gone and seen even just a tiny taste of what he's gone through to get there, I think it's easy to miss how many smart decisions and how well he's handled himself across. He's got the best, he's got the best exceptional Damn. speech I've ever seen at the Game Awards. Hands out, has not been topped oh. to this day. So good, so good. And, like, that stuff, people are like, oh, you're either good at it or you're not. No, no, 
you are not either good at it or not. You can have a little bit more natural talent than someone else, but to get that good at it takes so yes. much work and practice and like dedicated work and practice. Not just like, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to get better at it. It's like practicing a musical instrument. Like the amount of work he had to have done behind the scenes to get that good at so many different things is astounding. And I, th I think the reason it's not often talked about is because unless you've fumbled an acceptance speech, speech or unless you've made a mistake in your media career, his, his job is to make it look easy. So, like, having tried it and failed at it is a super good way of understanding how hard it is to make something look easy. You know what I also think? And how much... Too? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, you go. No, oh, I was going to say, you know what I think it is, too, is that with, with kind of funny specifically, you know, in relation to a lot of the other personalities and groupings that are on a place like YouTube, is that their following is not as big as a lot of the other places. Like, whenever... Like someone like PewDiePie again, just randomly go back to him. Whenever he like moves like an inch or breathes, that makes all the different blogs and all the different types of like you know uh, news channels and stuff. Or when you have like a Team Ten, like a Phase Clan, like because I know they went through some stuff recently. Whenever something like that you know, random happens with them, it's always making all the blogs and stuff. When someone like Greg Miller or even someone similar to him uh, does something, especially if it's good, it hardly gets talked about in any place, if at all. If not recognized, maybe in some of the different circles that we know from the different places like Kotaku, Polygon, IGN, etc. But like in all those other places where it's the same environment or the same realm and such, it won't even get mentioned. And I think that's yeah. because of the audience, because of the following. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's tricky, right? Because like we were saying before, when things are working, there's not much of a discussion there. Exactly. Like it's it's hard to figure out how to write like an 800 word story that's basically Greg Miller is a talented and funny guy who deserves his success because he works really hard at it. Like <laughs> that's a that's a hard headline to get anyone interested it's in. It's like okay, it's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Like great, you've told me the entire story. Like he's really talented and he worked really hard and he earned his success and he seems like a great guy. You, okay, cool. Like, you know, it's it, and and there there is something deeply sad about that where it's like you, you might be successful in terms of building an audience and building a brand and building a business but like you almost only become newsworthy if you mess up or if you do something and, horrible yeah because like but it's it's also not news when everything when everything works well you know it's like no no newspaper ever covers for the 5,000th day in a row, um, the postman delivered m my mail. And I don't think that's a problem with the outlet or the places that are reporting. I think that's more because of the audience. And I think that that's yeah. just the nature of the beast, especially with YouTube, you know, with how that audience tends to skew towards different varieties. So that's been a hot topic of debate and discussion for already the last year now, especially with all the changes that have been happening to YouTube here and there. And one of the things, and one of the things that I think you see in, in YouTube that you you don't often see in online writing, or at least less so, and I think this is part of the growing pains that YouTube is going through. If, if we if we consider this, you know, again, like everyone wants, we're fighting for attention because if you're reading a story, you have someone's attention. If so, if you're if someone is playing a video game you created, you have their attention. Like that's if someone's listening to your podcast, whether they're at work or in their car, you have their attention. Is that YouTube specifically? I often feel from the outside looking in, and I could be completely mistaken, and maybe this is just what makes the most noise. They talk about each other so much more often it gets very monotonous that i could definitely say <laughs> you're a lot on the money because as someone that's you know besides having my own personal youtube channel but like on you know the outside looking in and, and watching a lot of the content that's there it tends to be like not an echo chamber but like uh almost like a cycle amongst different individuals within the top that all talk about each other because they all feed off the different audience watching the different stuff and it's not yeah. just within like just the same group of personalities like you know how like they have mcns which is like a channel of networks 
or yeah. a, a group of networks that are or channels that are all over the place like and they work together and they only collab with each other here and there it's kind of like that but within kind of like a larger scale where it's just like millions upon millions of people all watching just the same like maybe five six maybe seven channels at some point all for like the most inane reasons though it's 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 fascinating to me how often it seems like like just for lack of a better term, drama fuels so much of it. And then you have people, you have the people involved with the drama, and then you have the people reacting to the drama, and then you have videos about... And you have the commenters. Which are not yeah, right. and then it's like, and, and it's, I find that, I find that so fascinating, because, you know, it, it, it's something I don't feel like, I don't, I don't watch enough, like stuff like Twitch streaming personally to know if it happens there, the but I know thing. it's the exact same thing. Oh, it is the same thing? Well, okay. To an extent, I should say, because again, I don't want to paint a too broad of a brush, but sure. I, from from like people that I know that are within that realm that, that also have been exposed to that, especially even going to like places like PAX and other events where you see a lot of that stuff, I could say, I could tell like there's a lot of parallels there between YouTube, uh, Twitch, and even you could argue with social media stuff like Instagram, even Twitter, to an extent where it's a very similar type of thing happening. And and I and I and I and I and I do think it is a growing pains thing because I do seem to remember when I was younger and again like coming up in like the world of like the gaming blogs when like Kotaku and Joystick were like you know you know fighting for page views and and there was there was Destructoid which was like Game this trailers. New- yeah, there's like all of it every and like I remember back then people wrote about each other a lot more. And uh, you would have arguments that would happen between, like, articles. Like, Destructoid would write an op-ed, and then another site would write, like, the other side of it and be like, this is why Destructoid is wrong about this. So I feel like, I, I do feel like that was more common in, like, the, the earlier uh, days of, again, back when they were, when we called them gaming blogs, which sounds like a ridiculous term now. Dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, so I, I do think it's going to be interesting to see what happens if that sticks around in video or if that ends up becoming less of a thing as video grows up and it becomes in, in, in like the ways to make money become a little bit more stable because man, it's like, I don't, I don't see how those I don't see how people on YouTube do it at all. I have a lot of respect for them because it's it tough. seems like it tough. seems it seems like YouTube changes the rules every twelve hours and they tell no one. That is a very true thing. And I, as someone that has friends that are based, you know, solely basing their living and income on you know YouTube videos, and more specifically now more than ever Patreon because it's been proven for a lot of people to really be sustainable. That could get very difficult, you know, because a lot of stuff is based on the algorithms that that's yeah. constantly evolving. And the thing is, like, you can't share that with other people, or at least people actively choose not to share that with others for fear of again going back to the scarcity model that we mentioned earlier. Sure. For that them taking advantage of that because people are already taking advantage of that already as it is besides like hot topics and stuff yeah and it's like you know when when i'm trying to get people to read a story i wrote on polygon like that the, that strategy changes all the time too because right now it's like there are certain things you can do to make google look at you more favor favorably and there's certain SEO yeah, properties. and there's certain things you can do to make Facebook, you know, look at you more favorably. Tag or, everybody. <laughs> there's, there's, all, there's all these things. And, I like, you know, I'm old enough to remember back in the day when if your story was on the front page of Dig, it meant a lot of traffic. Um, it used to be, like, Reddit drove a lot of traffic. And Reddit now has almost become, like, it's all, like, screenshots of articles. So no one really talks about Reddit or because... Tweets, or tweets. Yeah, or tweets. Right. Right, so it, it drives less traffic, so you see outlets talk about it a little bit less frequently. So that that changes a little bit, but it seems to me like it changes slowly enough that if you pay attention, you're able to stay on top of it. Or if, like, you know, if you work for, you know, a, a bigger site, there's people whose entire job is keeping on top of that. If it's a YouTuber, you're doing everything yourself. And so you might wake up in the morning and YouTube is like, okay, here are the new rules. You got to change your entire channel or you're not making money 
anymore. And that really sucks, to be honest. That has to, that I mean, it's has tough, to suck. It's tough being a freelancer. And again, you you know as well, like, you know, even when you were starting out, freelancing for just outlets like that, that's tough. But it's even more tough when you feel like you can't get a good grasp on stuff over time. Yeah. Because, especially and, with things changing so much. And and so if 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 anyone in the world of video ever says, "Yeah, but I have to I have to fight harder for what I have," I'll look him in the eye and go, "Yeah, man, like you, you do. Like the the situation you're coming up in is way more difficult than the situation I came up." And there's in. more people on top and of that, which is even crazier. Yeah, there's there's more people. It changes so much faster. It's it's so much harder to deal with. You ha- it's oof. It's rough. Yeah, it's I rough have out here in these streets. <laughs> I, have, I have no, I have no doubt that uh, the people out, out there starting out have have more challenges than I did. Like, yeah, fair play. I, I won't take that away from anybody. If you if you start from scratch now and you make it anywhere, like your hustle has to be intense. No one can, no one can take that. Like, it's just if you have any kind of audience. That's that's proof that your hustle is intense because you can't make it any other way. No lazy people make a dollar in this business. It doesn't happen. Definitely, I, I think that could be applied to any business or just any field. You know, in general, there's always a hard hustle. But I feel like you know, uh, with the, with YouTube and and just a lot of stuff in entertainment, that's what gets the most spotlight or at least gets the most shine because it gets the most conversation all over the yeah. place. But let me switch gears because we're going to start winding things down. Let me ask you a little bit about gaming in 2017 because we mentioned that this year might be the best year period of games. But what about sure. the game industry itself in, in your opinion? What's the best and the worst things happening right now with video games in your opinion? Oh, gosh. Um, okay, let's let's start with the positive. Yeah, Cause what, what, what's I'm, good about games right now? I'm trying, I'm trying to be a positive guy. I, I think... Um, I think the way games are evolving to be able to evolve is really positive. If you look at something like PUBG, which is taking the world by storm, and it's an amazing game. Very popular. And it's changing so rapidly, and it's adjusting based on how people are playing it, and what people are asking for, and what people are doing... And how people on streams are using it. It's a conversation between the developers and the community. Because the community might say they want one thing. But the actual analytics of how they're playing it might prove they actually want something else. Or the developer might put a feature in that's used in a way that they didn't see coming a mile away. And ends up being super cool. Or make streaming really interesting or lead to player behavior they didn't see coming. So they have to adapt. So it's almost like by just playing the game, you're having this great conversation with a developer and you're and you're listening to each other. And the game is being built as a collaboration. And I think that is that's that's really, really cool. If you look at a game, I recently got um, into a game called Warframe. Yeah. That came out years ago on PC and, and, and then the consoles and was an, one of the like the first free to play games on PlayStation. And when it came out, it was like it was OK. It was a fun game. I played it for a few hours and then was like, OK, this game seems pretty cool. And then never came back to it because it was just an OK game. Yeah. And who has time for OK games? Right. There's great not enough time. <laughs> yeah, there's not enough time for great games. And everybody started telling me, you got to look at Warframe again. Like, Warframe has been alive this entire time, and it's a completely different game now. So I tried Warframe, and I played it for a few nights, and I'm like, when did Warframe become, like, the best action game of 2017? <laughs> <laughs> like, Warframe has quietly, or not so quietly if you've been paying attention and you're part of the community, they update all the time. Their fans love them. They have added so many great features. They've refined the gameplay. They've added so much. They've taken away things that didn't work. They've put in things that are amazing. And now I'm like, there's a case to be made that Warframe is the best game of 2017. Like, a legit argument that this years-old game that I thought had completely disappeared 
somehow, through evolving with its user base, has become one of the best free-to-play action games you can play right now. I've seen a it lot e of games do that. Like, I've seen Ooh. a little bit of that from, like, Overwatch, even from Destiny, to an extent. We're getting that from PUBG, to, to some extent. Like, there's a lot of, like, update as you go, or change as you go, that completely, really kind of, like, uh, like fine-tunes the experience from when it, when it originally released. Yeah, and you have people, even with huge games, you have people like, oh, when's the next Grand Theft Auto coming out? And everyone else is like, Grand Theft Auto is on, like an online game now. Like, that's where the game's being released constantly. Like, so many people are playing that game online. And Rockstar is updating it with so many new things and adding things constantly. And they have such a huge player base that it's like, it almost feels like without a major shift in announced strategy, Grand Theft Auto became this MMO we just don't think about it that way. Mm. So, so this like this like ability for games to shift and change with the audience and listen to what people want and you know add things and take away things and be experimenting and if something just completely doesn't work, like take it out real quick, you know, before it, it hurts the game anymore. I I love that aspect of it and you know, Overwatch has already been through so many different changes, and, you know, uh, Blizzard has always been good about this. You know, World of Warcraft is, you know, who's who's out there asking for World of Warcraft 2, right? Exactly. There's been so many expansions and so many patches and so many changes that, like, the idea of a sequel is, is almost obsolete when it comes to that sort of game. And so that that's not a new trend. But I think we're starting to see people take it a, a little bit more seriously, maybe. Or at least, maybe I'm starting to take it more seriously, and I'm just universalizing. But I think 2017, with things like Warframe, Grand Theft Auto Online, blown up, and you see PUBG bank doing huge stuff, and like changing so fast, and adapting so quickly, I think that's super cool, because I think it pulls the community in closer, the the players begin to feel like more of a of a part of the process because they're being listened to and they can see it in the game changes and I just think and at that point you, you really do have to treat your players with respect because if you don't they'll leave true like there's a really easy way to tell if if what you're doing is working or not people are either showing up or they're not Battlefront Two is experiencing that really hard right about yeah they're, what, do you think, they're, what do you think about it like that's totally sure. true so um. I think I think EA thought they had a, a golden ticket. I because think Star they, Wars. Yeah, I think they were like, we have Star Wars has never been bigger. Like uh, our first Battlefront game did really good numbers. Um, we have this license. It's like there's no other AAA Star Wars game. Like we have this great engine. We have this talented team. Like we can push microtransactions, we can push loot crates really far because we have all of these advantages. So let's really use these advantages as far as we can. They thought and they had I, a full house, basically. I think they pushed a, uh, way too many chips in the middle of, uh, of the table, and I think they're seeing what happens when your hand is not as strong as you thought it was. I think they got a congratulations you played yourself moment, basically. Yeah! Oh. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good way to put it. I'm just saying, like, if I had the meme, like the like the actual audio board, that'd be the perfect time to play that because it's totally true. <laughs> like when you really think about it, there was such a, a blowback with that. I remember reading the different news posts and seeing the Reddit posts and all the reactions to it. It was really harsh, and you would think that because it's Star Wars, you like they would get a pass. And I'm pretty sure that's what they thought to some extent. You know, especially based off of how Battlefront changed originally from its original series with Pandemic and stuff, that they would get a pass of whatever it is that they did. But that wasn't the case this time. No, it was it was the the opposite of that. And there there is almost there is almost a compliment hidden in there. Because people people talk about Battlefront 2 and they vote and they post on Reddit and they make threads and they follow it so closely and the reason they do this is because they want the game to get to a point where they can play it and have fun. They want to buy the game. Exactly. If they if they didn't want to buy the game, they wouldn't care. The new Need for Speed had awful microtransactions, and the reason you don't see as many stories about it is because no one cares about Need for Speed. That is a very good point. It's an easy game to ignore because very few people care about it, 
care about it in the way that people care about Battlefront. You have this fan base that's telling EA Daily, for the love of God, fix your game so we can give you money. And EA is like, okay, we're going to adjust this. We're going to take this out. We're going to try this. But they tied so much of the game into this economy that's so broken that I don't think there is an easy or workable way to fix it to make people happy. Do you think I that th that's probably the worst thing that's happened this year, though? Like, that line of thinking? Because I know that's not the only game that's done that this year. I think it was Shadow of War. There's something similar. Some people are really making a big deal about Destiny 2's Eververse to some extent with that. Like, I, there, I'm pretty sure there was other games littered throughout the year besides Need for Speed that did something similar. Do you think that's probably the best, the worst thing out of 2017? I, I think... I I, I, th I think I think Battlefront Two is the worst stumble of 2017, hmm. and it's it's funny because everyone is like you know loot crates, loot boxes, microtransactions. It's it's this new thing, and it's like y you all mean I don't. It's not a new thing. It's not going away. Like it's that, that a buzzword at this point. That, that genie isn't going back in the bottle. Like I'm sorry, it's not. Um, it makes news when companies don't know how to do it or they push it too far. But like Overwatch, they handle it fine. I agree. Some people, some people don't like it, and and I respect that. I I get why people have an issue with it. I think there there is an argument to be made that it's kind of like gambling, especially when you have things like. Um, spending real money in PUBG, and then you can sell those items for even greater amounts of money. Like, that starts to get a little iffy when it comes to gambling laws. I am not a lawyer, so I can't really comment on it any further than that. It's very murky right now. I, it's what really I've read, murky. What I've been reading, like, some places say that it's not gambling, or at least the majority of places are saying it's not gambling, including them themselves. But also, I think it was Hawaii and then one country in, in Europe that said it that it was gambling. Like, it's very murky, but the conversation is being had right now. Yeah, and, and and until someone actually takes it to court, I don't think it's going to be settled because it is so murky. And anyone who tells you it's clearly gambling or it's clearly not gambling hasn't studied law because there's almost never a clearly anything in law. Um, I, I talked to a lawyer about fair use and Let's Plays, and she was like, nobody knows if it's fair use or not. Like, and neither side wants to take it to court. Because they know it's going to end badly. Like, I feel like that case with fair use yeah. specifically is going to end badly and everybody's going to be upset. And that's right. how it's going to be. If there, is, if there is case law that says it is fair use, then publishers cannot control Let's Players at all. If it, if it goes to court and it turns out it's not fair use, then the Let's Play industry is wiped out overnight. Like, done. And, Right, and both sides are so scared of losing that neither ever wanted to take it to court, ever. Because they want to have, have it both ways at this point, right. I feel like. Even the publishers, right. to an extent, because when it when it works for them, when like people love their game and they get that exposure, they're going to obviously more than likely at least at some point either get more sales or they're going to get good uh pr good you know a good perception of their game out there but if they don't have that anymore they just lose an outlet to put their games out there yeah so right now we're just kind of seeing like you know it, it's 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 kind of an ongoing negotiation like this is okay this isn't a company can push back this way but is that the right use of, of like like the thing with the DM dmca strike against PewDiePie, like, legally, that's actually what the DMCA is for. Ethically, is it okay to, like, silence someone in that way? I, I don't have a good answer. This is all brand new stuff. But it's never, I, I won't say never, but it's unlikely to actually be decided in a legal sense because everyone has so much to lose. I feel like that's going to change eventually, and a lot sooner it's than we think. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have to. Someone with deep pockets is going to take it all, all the way through to court. But to go back to, to loot boxes, like, I think Blizzard has figured out how to do it well. I think, I think Bungie with Destiny 2, I think there were some rumblings, but the game has still been incredibly successful. Definitely. And I don't think it hurt the game. Um, I, I think if you look at a game like Warframe, which has one of the best free-to-play systems that would take up an entire other hour for me to describe because there's so many parts to it. But it's a really good system, and you can play it for free forever without feeling like you're being pushed to, to pay for things. But when you do pay for things, you can see exactly where your money went and decide whether it's worth it or not. 
so it's it's fair. It feels good whether you pay money or whether you don't. So, like, none of this is new. There's plenty of companies who figured out how to do it right. But when a company pushes it too far or gets too greedy or they they literally don't understand the art that goes into creating a microtransaction-based economy. And it is an art the same way that every aspect of game development is an art. Um yeah, you end up with with really bad stuff, and I think I think as it becomes even more common, and as I think we we have more companies who are trying to do it without treating it with the respect it deserves, and looking at it as the art form it is, and messing up in really public ways, I think we're gonna have more disasters before it gets better. I agree. I think like there there could be very few disasters before something breaks. I feel like especially with this. Because again, you mentioned Destiny. Like I, as someone that really followed Destiny for a long time since since the beginning, it, it, it was never really with Destiny Two. I mean specifically, it was never really where I felt like I was forced to be part of that, or at least to get involved with that. You know, to spend real money if I didn't want to. And I felt like the conversation lately in regards to that game has been like, you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, that they were lied to, that they're being forced into something like that. And I feel like eventually, when there's more conversations like that with other titles, that's when things are going to get a lot worse. Yeah, and I mean, with Destiny, it was funny because it was like, oh, shaders are consumable now. That kind of sucks. I never even really com- cared about them. It, and then the honest. conversation was over. Yeah, like, it, 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 was in, it was in the, it made news for a day, and then everyone went back to playing Destiny 2. It was, it was more of an interesting wrinkle than, like, a big thing. But if you're playing Battlefront 2, you have to take part. I think it's and, much and, more and, worse and the, in that case, though, because the yeah, progression. yeah. And and you never know what you're going to get. And the progression system just isn't... Ugh, yeah. They did... They, it was it, really it's bad no, overall. But let, let me ask you this then, and this will be a good way to kind of wrap everything up, okay? So whenever we have somebody on the show, okay, we always ask them to, to give us one specific thing that they want to tell the audience, that they want to tell their fans or tell everybody else, that they feel like that those listening to this now could get something out of this, you know, good food for thought, whatever it might be. What is one thing that you feel like you could give to everybody right now that's listening to this episode? If I had one message I want to send out about gaming is that it is, it's like a, a tent that's big enough for everybody like there are there are no games more or less deserving than other games as long as it's not taking advantage of people and someone's having fun playing it like the, someone playing a mobile game on their phone uh, on the subway is, is is just as much of a game fan as someone who buys every new release at $60 or someone who you know just plays one obscure game and that's it i do not believe there is a single human being on this planet who doesn't like video games i sincerely believe there are many people on this planet who have not yet been introduced to the right game for them so i think like one of the best things I get to do in my job is tra- is to introduce people to the right game for them and get that email where it's like, oh, I was never really into games, and then I read this article, and I tried this game, and now I'm super into it, and I'm like, cool. Like, I just made the world of gaming one person bigger. So, like, everyone is a gamer. Some people just have yet to find their game. And, like, if you are given the opportunity to help people find their game, take it, because it is the most rewarding thing i think you can do in this hobby i i've never heard someone talk about it like that like i've we've heard and i pretty much have heard throughout the years people say that gaming is for everybody so but not talk about it in the way that you did i think that's pretty cool that that's a good thing that everybody i feel like will get out of this episode which i think is awesome i appreciate it thank you so much but but, but thank you ben for being on here with us or with me to talk, chat it up a bit. This is awesome. I think it was cool because, again, like I mentioned earlier, this is the first time we really spoke, and I think it was great. I think it was a fun convo. Such yeah, fun. absolutely. But, this went well. I had a ton of fun. Definitely. So where can everybody find you right now? You're on Twitter. You're at Polygon. Where can everybody interact with you? Yeah, you can you can, uh, you can can read my stories at Polygon.com, and my Twitter account is just at Ben Kachera. That's K-U-C-H-E-R-A, uh, Ben as in Ben. 
Nice. So th there'll be links to the description box as well as also on the postings on the website for you guys. Go directly to Polygon. Go directly to his Twitter and interact with him all over the place. Check out all his stuff. But again, thank you, Ben, for being on here on the show. Make sure that you guys leave a like on this video. Subscribe to the Coalition's YouTube channel for all our videos and all our content with new episodes of TK Spotlight, unboxing videos, reviews, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff that we got for you guys. I'll have even more surprises, hopefully, for you guys in the nearby future leading into the new year. Leave me a comment down below. Give me some suggestions questions on who you guys want me to bring on to the show as well as a whole bunch of other stuff feedback that you guys have about tk spotlight but with that being said we will talk to you again very soon peace out and stay epic